The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. We continue our study of great chapters in the Bible, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 has a Christmas message. Great chapters in the Bible, Luke chapter 2. "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. These words introduce one of the most popular and well-known of the Christmas poems. In fact, people are more familiar with this poem than with the biblical account of the night before Christmas, which is found in Luke chapter 2. Santa Claus is more real than Jesus Christ. And yet the real meaning of Christmas is not Santa and his pack, but Jesus Christ and his cross. While Christmas is universally celebrated, the real Christmas of the Bible is practically unknown. God's truth is the Bible. Therefore, what the Bible has to say about Christmas is actually more important than any poem or even the activities of Xmas. For today, Xmas is what we really have. Xmas is receiving gifts without receiving God's gift, Jesus Christ. Xmas is putting a light on a tree without having the light of the world. Xmas is commercial. But Christmas is biblical. The Bible tells us what happened on that first Christmas Eve. To recapture the truth about Christmas, let us turn now to the second chapter of Luke. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, gives us the background for the first night before Christmas. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. The word for tax means that all the world should be enrolled for a census. This is a reference to the Roman world, and Rome was about to take a census to discover the actual size of its population in the empire. And this census was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, that is, the Roman province of Syria. And all went to be enrolled or taxed, everyone in his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Here, then, is the background for the night before Christmas. Here is the Virgin Mary carrying the Lord Jesus Christ, that is, his humanity. For Jesus Christ is the unique person of the universe. He is the God-man. Physical birth is the beginning of his human life, but his deity always existed. For Jesus Christ is the Word, and in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was face to face with God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. The first Christmas Eve was the birthday of Jesus Christ, who is the author of eternal life. He is eternal God, and he became man. Now, Jesus Christ had to become man because he had to go to the cross for our sins. It is impossible for God to die. And so, if we are going to understand the significance of Christmas, we begin with verse 7, where we find the night before Christmas was a night of life and death. Luke chapter 2, verse 7 tells us, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. Here is the record of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will notice that when he was brought into the world, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes are often used for death, for the wrapping of those who are dead. The eternal Son of God took upon himself the form of man. He did this on the first Christmas Eve. But even that moment when he became a man, a member of the human race, he was wrapped in death clothes, in swaddling clothes. Ezekiel 16.4 tells us how these clothes were used to wrap the dead. Here is a baby with new life, and yet wrapped in grave clothes. At Bethlehem on the first Christmas Eve, there was the shadow of the cross. 
and the real significance of Christmas does not lie in the birth of Jesus Christ so much as in the cross where he went for our sins. For in the Christmas account in Matthew, Matthew 1.21, we read, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus Christ came into the world to be our Savior. He became true humanity so that he could go to the cross and bear our sins and take our place. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his druze we are drawn together. For all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And God the Father hath laid on God the Son the iniquity of us all. And so that first night before Christmas was a night of life. Jesus Christ came into the world. It was also a night of death because he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And perhaps these swaddling clothes are the first prophecy of the cross with regard to his life on the earth. For those swaddling clothes speak of death, where Jesus Christ died for our sins, where Jesus Christ became our substitute, where Jesus Christ provided for us eternal salvation. For neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Secondly, the night before Christmas was a night of good news. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terribly afraid, the Greek says. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The night before Christmas was a night of good news. Notice, for example, that wonderful phrase in verse 10, Great joy to all people. Good tidings are a cause for joy. Joy means inner happiness, and here is the true meaning of Christmas. If you want to enter into Christmas in a very meaningful and wonderful way, then accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and the joy of the Lord will become your strength. The word joy means inner happiness. True Christmas is up in that frontal lobe. Christmas is in the mind of the one who was born again, who knows that he's a child of God, who knows that he cannot lose his salvation, who understands that he has an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the proper time. The good tidings are for all people. You will notice that in this phrase it says, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Christ died for the entire human race. He died for all people. When he hung upon the cross, the sins of the world were poured out upon him. And God the Father actually judged these sins. And Jesus told us that these sins were judged at that time when he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did the Father forsake the Son? Because our sins were poured out upon him. And as they were poured out upon him, the Father had to judge, and therefore Jesus paid the penalty of sin, which is spiritual death. God the Father separated himself from the Son on the cross. The good tidings concern salvation. Verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. There is a solution to the sin problem, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The proclamation was made on that first Christmas Eve. The absence of the definite article calls attention to the character of the person. A Savior means that the emphasis is on this word. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And these good tidings center around one person, Christ the Lord. For this is the record, God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. In verse 13, the night before Christmas was a night of heavenly worship. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Here we find the angels themselves, the great hosts of heaven, praising God because of the advent of the Savior. The angels set a precedent which has been ignored by man. True worship is based on personal relationship with Christ. It is impossible to enter into the true spirit of Christmas apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's review for a moment. 
First of all, the night before Christmas was a night of life and death, Luke 2.7, with emphasis on the swaddling clothes. Secondly, the night before Christmas was a night of good news, Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, where we have great joy to all people, a Savior, Christ the Lord. Thirdly, the night before Christmas was a night of heavenly worship, as illustrated by the angelic worship. In verse 14, we discover that the night before Christmas was a night of potential peace. We read, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward man. Now, the Greek translation is much different from what we have in our English. Actually, this particular passage should read, Glory to God in the highest, and upon earth peace in men with whom he is well pleased. Whether it is for you or not depends upon your attitude toward Christ. Peace in men with whom he is well pleased. Now, God is well pleased with those who do his will. And the will of God is declared in 1 John 3.23. This is the will of God that we believe on his Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, if we are going to have peace, we must have it on the basis of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only Savior. On that first Christmas Eve, he came into the world in order to provide salvation for us. And this peace is expressed in Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the night before Christmas was a night of potential peace. But it's potential, depending upon your attitude toward Christ. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The next item in the night before Christmas is found in Luke 2, 15 and 16. The night before Christmas was a night of reverent seeking. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into the heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the new baby, lying in a manger. Now we know from the Mishnah that these men were not ordinary shepherds watching ordinary flocks. These men were carefully chosen to watch the flocks used for a temporal sacrifice. The shepherds were watching sheep destined to portray the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And those very sheep being watched that night by the shepherds, they would be taken into the temple. And there they would be offered as sacrifices. And there each one of these sheep would portray what Jesus Christ came into the world to fulfill. For Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Furthermore, these shepherds knew the word of God. While the angels referred only to the city of David, the shepherds went immediately to Bethlehem. This indicates some knowledge of Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Yet more than knowledge, it indicates faith. The religious leaders of Israel knew Micah 5, 2, but they had no faith to put their knowledge into action. But we discovered that the shepherds made haste. Oh, on Christmas Eve, if only you would make haste and come to the cross. If only you would make haste to seek Jesus Christ. You could find him as your Savior in one second of time. Nineteen hundred years ago, Jesus Christ had you personally in mind when he went to the cross, and he died for your sins, and he took your place. And the Scripture says, Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Think of it. Right now, you can make haste to Jesus Christ. And when you receive Christ as your Savior, then every day becomes Christmas. Make haste to receive Jesus Christ and therefore put Christ back in Christmas and make your life meaningful now and forever. In verses 17 and 18, we discover that the night before Christmas was a night of effective witnessing. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. They made known once and for all. In other words, they made the issue clear. This is effective witnessing for Christ. We must make the issue clear to a lost and dying world. People must understand that their attitude toward Christ determines their eternal salvation. There's nothing man can do for salvation, for the Scripture says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. 
the issue must be clarified today. People must understand that the work of salvation was accomplished on the cross, that Jesus said, It is finished. There is nothing we can add to it. There is no further work which can be added to what Jesus Christ did. He bore our sins. He was our substitute. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. And the true meaning of Christmas is found in the cross. And as a result of the witness of the shepherds, we read in verse 18, and all they that heard it wondered, or literally, they were amazed at those things which were told them by the shepherds. The shepherds made the issue so clear that they were amazed. They were astounded. They just simply were flabbergasted by this fantastic news. Oh, if today people could only make the issue clear, if believers in witnessing would just tell the simple gospel story and not muddy up the water with all sorts of false issues. Whether a person joins a church or not is not the issue in salvation. Baptism is not the issue in salvation. Walking down an aisle is not the issue in salvation. Feeling sorry for sins is not the issue in salvation. These are all works. But the Scripture makes the issue very clear. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And then in verse 19, the night before Christmas was a night of quiet meditation. But Mary kept all these things and meditated in her frontal lobe or in her mind. The word ponder means to meditate. It is in the imperfect tense in the Greek, which means she kept on thinking about these things. The word for heart is actually the mind or the thinking part of the mind. And Mary kept thinking about these things. She took these things into her mind. She pondered them. She considered them. She thought about them. If you want to have the greatest Christmas in your life, and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, even as Mary was. Why don't you try this? Spend your Christmas thinking about the Word. Get the doctrine, read the Word, study the Word, saturate your mind with the Word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's the Word of God which is alive and powerful. He has magnified His Word above His name. And the greatest Christmas you could ever have is a doctrinal Christmas, meditating on the things of the Word, occupied with the person of Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Now let's review from this great chapter in the Bible, Luke 2, some of the characteristics of the night before Christmas. First, the night before Christmas was a night of life and death. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. Secondly, the night before Christmas was a night of good news. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Thirdly, the night before Christmas was a night of heavenly worship. Luke chapter 2, verse 13. Fourth, the night before Christmas was a night of potential peace. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Fifth, the night before Christmas was a night of reverent seeking. Luke chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. Sixth, the night before Christmas was a night of effective witnessing. Luke chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Seventh, the night before Christmas was a night of quiet meditation. Luke chapter 2, verse 19. In the Saturday Evening Post of 1 September 1951, a most interesting account was written by Chaplain Gerke, who was the chaplain for many of the Nazi criminals during the famous trials. Chaplain Gerke won many of the top Nazis to the Lord Jesus Christ in the closing days of their life at the Nuremberg prison. Among them was von Ribbentrop. Of course, he failed with Hermann Goering, but the story of how he witnessed to these various famous men is a most interesting one. And in one paragraph of his story, he describes their last Christmas Eve before these famous men were executed. They were assembled in the prison chapel, where Chaplain Garricky read this same passage which we have examined very briefly in this study. 
After hearing this passage, and after singing some carols, they return to their cells to await death. One of these top Nazis was Fritz Saukel, who said on that Christmas Eve, quote, We never took time to appreciate Christmas and its biblical meaning. Tonight we are stripped of all material gifts and away from our people. But we have the Christmas story, and that's all we really need. End quote. Yes, Sometimes people have to come face to face with death, as these top Nazi leaders did, and then they turn to the Christmas story, and then they see it in its true perspective, not simply living it up, not the exchange of gifts, but receiving the greatest of all gifts. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Jesus Christ is the great gift, and this is the true meaning of Christmas. He was given to the world as the only way of salvation. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's why Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's why Jesus says, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. The night before Christmas this year will be a time of festivity, merrymaking, parties, excitement. It will be a time of exchanging gifts. Will anyone give a thought to the Savior that night? It's His birthday. It was the day in which His humanity came into the world to provide for us eternal life. For out of his birthday comes his death day, and out of his death day comes our life day. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And in this chapter we have a brief description of the night before Christmas, the night before the first Christmas, and its true meaning to us. I have written a poem with regard to the night before Christmas, which brings in the biblical principle and focuses our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. T'was the night before Christmas, and all through the world a message was preached, a challenge was hurled. Believe on the Son, and thou shalt be saved, for the road to heaven with His blood was paved. Out of the darkness of sin and despair... God's salvation, the fairest affair, was born in a manger, no room in the inn. God in the flesh, He died for our sin. The angels sang, the shepherds rejoiced, Messiah had come, the message was voiced by joyous believers both far and near. Christmas has come, Emmanuel is here. The real significance of Christmas lies in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christmas is meaningless unless Jesus Christ is your Savior. He went to the cross. He died for your sins. He took your place. He became your substitute. And even though Christmas takes many twists and turns, and even though the true perspective of Christmas is often lost, in all of the excitement of pleasure-seeking and partying, and even though man becomes very selfish and very sentimental at Christmas time, the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever reminds each generation of the true meaning of Christmas. What is Christmas? What's it all about? Well, the answer is found in the Word of God. Christmas means Christ. Christ means salvation. Salvation means that your Christmas and all of its parties and all of its excitement and then the bitterness and the aftermath, all of it can be changed in a moment of time. Jesus Christ can become your Savior right where you sit right now. Listening to my voice in this moment, you can have eternal salvation. How? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.